The documentary, While We Watched, captures a crisis of TV journalism in India that should be a warning to the rest of the world. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. While We Watched profiles India's renowned TV journalist Ravish Kumar. For years, Kumar thrived as the anchor at NDTV, the Indian equivalent to CNN. He delivered a nightly broadcast in Hindi, reaching wide audience. And while we watched, we witness how Indian commentators on other channels abandon traditional reporting and replace it with a style of vitriol that American viewers would associate with Fox News. Filmmaker Vinay Shukla followed Kumar over several months as NDTV struggled to hold on to staff amidst shrinking budgets and a loss of advertisers. Kumar comes under extreme pressure, including death threats. Yet through it all, he remains steadfast in his mission to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. The film was produced by Brit Doc and was among the final projects of the beloved executive producer Jess Search, who died this year of brain cancer. While we watched, premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival, where it won the Amplify Award. This past summer, it opened theatrically in the UK and at New York's IFC Center. The film is currently streaming for free in the U.S. from the PBS series POV. I spoke to Vinay Shukla from his base in Goa, India. Vinay is among a new generation of Indian documentary makers who have gained international recognition. On an episode earlier this year, I spoke to another member of that generation, Sean Xen, who directed the Oscar-nominated documentary All That Breathes. Sean told me that he sees the rise of this new generation, starting with the film An Insignificant Man, about an insurgent politician. An Insignificant Man was the first film directed by Vinay Shukla in partnership with Kushbu Ranka. I asked Vinay what he was hoping to do with that first film. So An Insignificant Man had me and Kushbu both. And both of us, when we started that film, we were in our mid-twenties. We were, uh, you know, this uh, new anti-corruption protest movement was happening in India. Uh, we were, we had done a fair bit of traveling and we remember being in Egypt and witnessing uh, the Egypt Tahrir Square protests and just how much sort of media and documentation was happening uh, amongst the protesters there. So both of us came back to India really inspired and uh, uh, you know we saw what was happening with the Indian anti-corruption protest and we decided and these protesters at that point had just sort of decided to form a new political party. So we thought it would be interesting to just go to you know a rally of theirs. Uh, we went to a rally, we realized that there is some sort of a story here, some sort of a documentary here, but nobody seemed interested in shooting it. So we said, you know, we'll do it. Uh, uh, so it started really, really, uh, it, it, it started almost instinctively for us. I remember we met Shonak uh, uh, during uh, the production of that film. And that film, uh, Tom, honestly, the political party that we were following, they became much bigger than what anybody had imagined. You know, they went on to fight their first election and win. And as they became much bigger, uh, Kushbu and I uh, 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 had to scale up to keep up with what they were becoming. So we became filmmakers on the film make, on that film. To give you some idea, we shot for the first three months of An Insignificant Man without any uh, uh, sound equipment. So we would take the footage to our friends and they would be like, wow, this looks great, but we can't hear anything. <laughs> so it was, uh, 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 you know, it was a very scrappy setup. We were, uh, we were really inspired to tell the story around us of uh, young, uh, intelligent politicians who were trying to figure out what was the possibility uh, of new policy within the realm of existing politics. Of course, it was a very, very challenging struggle, but we found we thought that it would be interesting to see these characters on the big screen. Uh, initially, you know, we would take the footage to a lot of people in India and, 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 and ask them if they would like to fund the film. And they would be like, this footage looks great. If you make a fiction film out of this, we'll fund it. Because India has a very, very vibrant fiction film market, but a documentary market, not so much. 
but we were very very convinced that these were the characters that we wanted to see on the big screen these we had been and you know khushbu would talk about this very passionately that we had been deprived of watching intelligent indians talking about their lives on the big screen and with documentaries we had the chance to bring that uh, to cinema so that was the uh, that was a sort of genesis of an insignificant man that film you know faced a fair amount of struggle in getting the film out uh, uh, we were denied a censor board certificate earlier then we had to go to the court and we had to fight a very very long very hard battle not long battle so much uh, the film came out it ran in theaters for 9 weeks in india setting a new sort of box office records of sort uh, but i think on that film we also everybody is just suddenly understood because of the kind of support an insignificant man had in terms of you know box office also for example we did a crowdfunding campaign on that film to fund it we were looking to raise $20000 we landed up raising $120000 so that was a moment for a lot of filmmakers to feel empowered that here is something that can be replicated and more films uh, have a shot at this so coming off of that uh making your first documentary film can be an energizing experience it can also be a um uh, uh depleting experience uh you know what was your feeling coming off of it um that set you on a course for the the next step in your path it was initially very very energizing and towards the latter end of it very depleting i'll be honest because that film was co-directed between me and khushbu we were both there it was the first film for both of us and you know every day when there was a crisis on your first film you feel like your film is going to blow up and you will never get to make a film again so you are you know every every obstacle feels like an attack and that's how we honestly responded against every crisis and against each other very honestly we we managed to achieve a lot on that film but uh, as the film was coming out i remember for example we were fighting so hard on raising money so hard against the censorship battle so hard in terms of getting the film in cinemas like let me give you an example of we went to cinemas with the film and they said uh, nobody watches documentaries in india there's no way uh anybody's going to come to the theaters so we convinced four theaters to give us one show each in the four major metros across india uh and we said if you are able to sell these tickets then will you give us more shows they said cool so we put out those four shows and those shows got sold out within an hour then the film went on then you know those shows uh, uh those cinemas put in more shows and then the film was seen in more weeks uh, in more cinemas in week 2 and week 3 and that's how it expanded but all of that was a fight you know so by the time we finished that film uh, uh both me and khushbu were like we don't want to make uh, we don't we we definitely don't want to co-direct the film uh, uh, uh immediately after this she's my producer on this film but we decided we sort of uh, uh, uh involved on each other's projects but uh, from a distance at the same time you know that film was so much about idealism face uh, uh what happens to idealism when it's when it's confronted by the realities of today's political systems and i found my own idealism severely challenged during the process of that film as rejuvenating as it was as successful as it was uh, uh you know i i jokingly say that, that that film really helped my idealism mature so by the time i uh, by the time i got out of it i really began to wonder if what the limitations and possibilities of idealism are in today's world and if if it really has a place out there you know i i was making documentaries in a country wherein people love fiction films i can i can very easily you know catch any child in india and tell them that i want to watch a film and they'll be immediately ready and if i was to catch anybody and tell them that i want them to show uh, uh, that i'm going to take them for a documentary they would immediately leave the room so i you know i i am working against the grain every day that we choose to make non fiction in india every documentary filmmaker who chooses to turn up uh, to do their job in india 
has to tell themselves every day that they, that yes this is worth it there is a moment of crisis which is almost almost you know an introspection which is 5 minutes away so i knew that i was working in a country where in the mainstream while i had seen a fair amount of success uh 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 you wonder if there is an audience out there who cares enough and the process of filmmaking is also such tom that you know it's very insular especially the creative process of it uh, uh, there is not validation coming to you every day and as sometimes i jokingly say no amount of public validation is enough so uh, uh, so it's uh, <laughs> you're you're fighting against uh, 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 everything there is and i came when when i came to this film i was searching for a new i was searching for a new story which is more reflective of where i was uh in my own life as somebody who was questioning their idealism and somebody who was questioning their own relevance vis-a-vis the society around them and uh, that's when i came across ravish so th- this is the origin of while we watch explain who ravish kumar is for uh, people who aren't aware sure uh, ravish Ravish Kumar is uh, you know the 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 protagonist uh, in uh, while we watched he is a prime time news anchor he does uh, uh, his broadcast uh, in hindi while i was shooting with him he was an anchor at ndtv which is one of uh, which india's most famous news uh, news televisions news channels and ravish has been doing this for over 20 years unlike most other news channels and news anchors and news shows in india uh, you know which are usually these uh, uh debates and panel shows wherein that you know there'll be like five people 10 people at times 15 people debating an issue uh, ravish does a 40 minute piece to camera like he will sit in front of the camera and he will give you his take on what happened on that day in the news it will be mixed with it will be satire it will be very very hard reportage it will be opinion uh but it it was very unlike uh, and on some nights it would straight up be performance art so it was very very unlike the conventional news broadcast he was clearly an author and artist uh who was you know having some great days and others not so but when i came across ravish doing his news on indian television something that i found really really striking was you know at times he would slip into these comments wherein he would say things like uh you know while uh, while every other news anchor would spend a lot of time telling their audiences that you know the audience is number one and we are here to serve you we are here to serve the audience ravish was actually scolding his audiences at times and saying things like that the biggest problem in in the news culture of today is that the audiences are watching bad news tv so the audience needs to stop watching tv and even if nobody watches my shows i'll still continue doing what i need to do uh, which i found you know here was his, here was somebody in the news he was who was actually asking his audience to not watch the news anymore it, it was weird it was concerning it was charming it was disturbing uh, and i felt like there was here was a news anchor who was also being very very vulnerable or vulnerable on air here was a protagonist here was a character who seemed like he had seen a better time uh, and is now beginning to wonder about his own relevance in the news ecosphere around him so this news anchor wasn't just questioning the governments uh, you know of the day he was also questioning his audiences and chastising them almost thereby uh, you know alienating two of the foundational sort of pillars uh, for his own career i found it to be a good place to start an inquiry as to where news is at today and what's happening to those who are working within the news ecosphere so you saw him as a man searching similar to the way you were in a point of your life of uh of of searching um when you embarked on the film what did you imagine was going to be the structure of the film i was initially when i started the film actually one of the things that uh, i was really really inspired to do was use a lot of animation within the film uh 
because you know there was so much that was happening within Ravish's own to put it very very directly in with his with his own mental state like the job was clearly taking a toll on his mental health as you see within the film that it seemed like he was not as in control as uh, you would think that he is in and i really initially thought that i would use animation i mean one of my favorite films was walls with bashir and i was very very inspired to do uh, uh, something like that and then i went to funders and i asked them for money and they were like animation no way <laughs> there is no way we have money for animation of course they were justified but uh, so i came back to this film i mean i came back to the sort of drawing board while we were shooting i knew very clearly that it has to be a story you know one of the films i'll tell you two films that i really liked while i was making this and you know then editing it one was on un- uh, one was uncut gems which had a sort of relentless anxiety about it and the other was uh, this film by michael haneke called a more which is so much about loss i i wanted to go for the after effects of both these films so when you see the film right now it's cut very fast and it's cut very relentlessly it's all, it's it's cut in the manner that news is cut in that news uh, almost desensitizes you uh, in 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 how fast it is so i have tried to use the same format but to try and sensitize people to the crisis within the news and while the film is about individual perseverance it's also about systemic failures within the news industry in today's times do you see an entire news channel go through a lot you see people leaving the newsroom you see their ratings fall you see you you know not enough journalists within newsrooms to cover the kind of stories they want to you see their signals being blocked you know it's like i okay let me put it this way but uh, when i started making films i used i was very very inspired by films of jia zangke right i remember watching platform i remember watching a uh, uh, shanghai and and here was a filmmaker who was able to narrativeize his people in a manner which 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 i which i strongly identified with right when i am making documentary films uh, i am looking to narrativeize what's around me and 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 bring it in in a language and bring it out in a language that's comprehensible to the people around me so that they engage with it it's really very simple so uh, uh, in in india uh, people watch a lot of fiction films and my films are inherently structured like fiction films they flow it's it's an obse- is it's an observational documentary format where wherein one scene speaks to another speaks to the next uh, and and you know a vivid portrait is formed uh so my only focus as i was shooting this was to have a sort of emotional continuity within the scenes uh so that there's some sort of a larger cinematic impact you talked about witnessing the effects on ravish's mental health of everything he's going through and one of the things we witness in the film is a constant um stream of threats that he's receiving including death threats people who call his phone and he answers these calls can you talk about what you uh, witnessed in his ex- his willingness to confront uh people who seem to hate him i think something that's very vital to understand about ravish is that he al- he picks up or he answers a lot of the phone calls that he gets is because he's also dependent on these phone calls for news and for coverage uh his news network didn't have enough money to afford you know on ground stringers so he depended on citizens on citizen journalists to send him stories and that meant that he he had to be you know open to uh to whatever was coming at him through his phone and secondly you know you see him answering a lot of these phone calls and engaging uh with people who are you know actively trolling him because at least i feel that here was somebody who was trying to figure out how to deal with those who disagree with him you know it's not a very clean answer and there is no one answer that can serve you in all days on some days maybe you can switch off on some days you do try and engage to the best of your capacity uh the the scene that you see within the film wherein you know he's 
he's he's engaging very very actively with with people who are uh, trolling him and then he asks them to sing and at one point ravish begins begins to laugh uh, almost manically is i remember shooting that scene and being uh, you know being a little uncomfortable because you begin to wonder if he is in control and if you should be and and if he is losing control then should you be there shooting uh you know most documentary filmmakers that i know we decide we usually make the call that let's shoot and we'll decide on the ed- edit table whether you want to keep it or not but uh, it's a it's also a very journalistic instinct i think you know a lot of journalists have that uh you know they will engage they will try and engage with people uh, uh for as long as they can because that's their job you were filming with Ravish uh, for a set period of time that uh, ended a few years ago. Y- you finished the film last year, premiered uh, at Toronto in September 2022. Um, can you talk about you know, what's happened to Ravish since then? Ravish uh, is right now running his own YouTube channel. He continues to do the journalism that he was. Within the film, you see him reporting uh, at NDTV. That news network was then uh, bought by a, 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 a very rich billionaire from India. So Ravish then uh, gave up uh, his position at NDTV and moved on to YouTube, wherein he is now a really strong force to reckon with. He has about 7 million subscribers, and it's growing continuously. So with Ravish, journalism is his calling, but I guess it's also his curse. There is no way that he can stop doing it. And the film is... You know, it's it's an ode to the perseverance of individuals against massive difficulties. So, um, you know, where, where the film ends, you know that the institution itself is is going through a lot, and you know it doesn't come a, as a, as a surprise where the institution is today. But I am hoping that when people watch this film, they understand that you know ultimately the solutions lie in institutional solutions. as much as this film is about ravish and where he's at and of course he continues to do you know good journalism he continues to go from strength to strength for as long as we have uh, uh, you know our hopes in individuals and 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 you know very often i say in india you know for as long as you hope that you know one government one political party one news organization one news anchor will be the solution to all our problems it won't happen sooner than later individual people and governments and uh, uh, uh basically individuals they disappoint you that's why it's almost fundamental that we have institutional solutions for example what is it that we are doing that will uh, you know empower more women journalists to come forward uh, uh more people from marginalized uh, communities to come forward and become journalists uh, and 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 be able to have a thriving career uh it's not about ravish it's about the next generation of journalists who are coming forward currently journalism as an institution is is under attack and crisis and across the world not just in india one of the reasons for example you know this film uh we had a packed screening at doc aviv uh in uh, in tel aviv israel and so many journalists came forward and especially with what's happening in israel right now uh, and they said this is exactly what's happening in tel aviv in in, ter- in terms of how journalists uh, are are being uh uh challenged by their audiences when they get out into the street for for not being uh, 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 you know uh, for not supporting uh whoever the ruling establishment is but it's it's a very very polemical time and my ambition continuously is to try and build a dialogue about how is it that we can build a better journalism uh through ravish's story when you talk about institutions and i I've, i've been listening to you um speak about that in the last few weeks when when you were in new york uh giving screenings and it made a big impression on me uh particularly as we think about the documentary film industry and and uh, the institutions of movie theaters that are under threat and the institutions of streamers that uh seem to be going in a different direction than the kinds of independent documentaries that um that I, I wish they'd support um but one institution that was uh really critical to this film and to many documentaries uh is that of doc society um and uh, we're speaking 
two weeks after the death of uh, of one of their visionary leaders, uh, Jess Search. Um, I wonder if you can talk about what uh, Doc Society and the, and their other branch, Brit Doc, and Jess Search meant to this project. Jess was my exec producer. Uh, you know, there's there's Jess, Maxine, BD, Vijay, Anu, and you know Luke Kushbu and me. So this is the sort of producing team we have on the film. Jess. You know, it's been, uh, it's just been a lot of, it's been an honor and a privilege. Whenever I think about Jess, I smile and I laugh because uh, uh, she was, she was a riot. She was, she was so full of magic and solutions and there, she had a certain, uh, you know, for example, Jess was the only person uh, who I could, w w when I was in my deepest crisis, uh, uh, I could not just call her for help, but I could call her for revenge <laughs> because Jess, <laughs> Jess would, would, would make you feel like that, that, you know, together me and you will fight this. She uh, has been on the, she was on the process, uh, she was on the project since, uh, from the process of development. We... Uh, had it was uh, it was a difficult project in many ways including you know the sort of legal uh, challenges we had on the project and Jess was always 10 steps ahead you know, if there is if there is one person who inspired me to be continually brave and 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 and, and feel okay to be brave it was Jess on this project she would she would figure solutions to whatever problems you had. She would find you money when nobody could. She would think of legal challenges that you hadn't quite envisioned. She would, uh, and not just that, she would then, you know, uh, uh, hook you up with a lawyer that you needed to speak to who had already been briefed about the case by Jess and who was coming to the table with, uh, with enough solutions. So she and, you know, even Doc Society and, you know, I worked very, very closely with Maxine, for example. Uh, um, unlike a lot of funders, uh, and, you know, everybody has their own strength, uh, they, Doc Society not only puts money into the film, but at least in mine, they put all their heart and all their time. Uh, Jess, was, Jess would be up. Uh, whenever there was a, a submission deadline, she would watch all my cuts. She would uh, uh, she would see all my contracts, whatever I was signing with anybody. She would uh, she would make she's made sales happen on this film. So, you know, now that she is gone, I I'm I'm thinking about her and I'm laughing uh, because I I only remember her fondly. The, the only note of sadness I have is that more people will not experience uh, uh, her uh, her visionary being. Uh, she was she, there was there is absolutely nobody like her in in how they can inspire everybody around them, in how she can in, in how they can party with you, in how they can take care of you. I remember being uh, you know on one of my trips in London, and I was. Uh, trying to research another project and I was really in a difficult place and Jess opened up her, uh, her house you know Jess and BD and they said you can just stay here so I remember sort of uh, sleeping in their house uh, 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 waking up to them making uh, a breakfast for me uh, and while some you know head of state is also at the breakfast table uh, so they were uh, she was like family you know you've talked about working in an environment of uh, legal challenges, um, which sounds a little abstract uh, when you say it, uh, but I wonder if you can fill in the, the, the context for not only what you face, but what any independent journalist in, in India today uh, faces um, in, in terms of pushback. Okay, so what has happened is that over the years, it's become very, very difficult for filmmakers to take on political hot topics within uh, the medium of cinema. Uh, I'm not sure if it's happening across the world, but it's definitely happened in India. And uh, uh, 
there are various reasons for it. Various governments have used uh, the tools that they have at their disposal to make uh, life difficult for filmmakers. Uh, so it's it's become imperative that when you're making your film and when you're shaping it, you're aware of the legal consequences throughout. For example, what is said, uh, uh, what contracts do you have between the people that you're shooting with, between your uh, partners on the project, what kind of funding model do you have, how, what kind of insurance do you have, at what stage, what kind of... Uh, 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 legal support you have for any crisis that you may find yourself in. For, uh, I was shooting within a news organization uh, in India. I, I don't remember the last documentary that happened within a sort of mainstream news channel uh, like the one that I have currently made. Uh, I mean, there's Writing with Fire that uh, Rintu and Susmit have done, but, but my film takes place within an active newsroom within New Delhi, so, for example, in, in my film, the challenge is not that uh, very often when you're shooting documentaries, you have to start by explaining to people what is a documentary. Uh, in my newsroom, everybody knew the power of documentaries. So it's a very, very sensitive situation. It's a very sensitive place that you're walking into. And no amount of you know, preparation in the head can tell you what you're up against. So I relied on Doc Society to really educate me in the ways of shooting within the news ecosphere about the kind of permissions that you have, the kind of permissions that you need to navigate early on in your uh, in your shoot, uh, how you're approaching characters, what how is it that you're going to negotiate access uh, with and without paperwork. As the film gets out, there is a fair amount of legal anxieties that, uh, you know, people in India have and not just the people in India but filmmakers have with regards to what can happen when the film goes out uh, you know about what is being said uh, in, in India sometimes defamation laws are used very very liberally by people to say that this so and so that is being said against me it puts me portrays me in a bad light so literally every line has to be fact checked every line has to be legally uh, uh, scrutinized uh, within my film, we don't have the benefit of hindsight, wherein we, I'm not looking back at 30 years, I'm not looking back at 40 years. So I am literally telling you a story that happened two years ago. So it's as live as it gets. And that comes with its own challenges. You know, reality keeps changing, people's uh, 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 allegiances keep changing. And to be able to be prepared for that landscape, uh, it's been really, really helpful to have Doc Society around. We're speaking uh, in mid-August 2023. Just last month in July, you did a kind of three-week tour with Ravish uh, from Mumbai to London to New York, uh, showing the film to audiences there. Can you talk about what that experience was like? I mean, I, it was the most uh, exhilarating three weeks that I've had. We started, for example, our film premiered last year at Toronto, uh, and, I, and then we played at Doc NYC, and those, sort of, those two screenings really set the buzz around the film. Uh, you know, there was a lot of love for the film internationally, and people have been waiting for me to bring the film to India. The challenge is that currently, in spite of the sort of distribution success that I've had internationally, I don't have a distribution offer from any streamer or any theatrical distributor in India. Uh, but we are, we are so we are trying our best to get the film out. Uh, but Anand Patwardhan, who is a legendary uh, Indian documentary filmmaker, who actually introduced me uh, to documentaries, he was kind enough to say that he would host a screening of the film, a private screening of the film. Uh, in Bombay, which was held at Prithvi Theatre, which is this iconic uh, theatre in Bombay. And, uh, you know, I, it was probably one of the most special nights of my life. That It was a packed theatre. Uh, there were friends from the film industry, friends, uh, people whose lectures I had been to as a cinema student uh, and, and, and as a uh, person without a job in my early 20s. So I was very, very touched 
there was the longest ending ovation after that film i think it went on for some 3 4 minutes and uh, and it was a very very lively q and a after that and people really were, were asking me about how they can host more screenings in fact we have been able to host more screenings after that from there onwards we went to london both me and ravish we did three q and a's in london i went to manchester birmingham lewis every q and a that we did was absolutely packed uh, the film was very very uh, uh, it's still running across uk and uh, we what we were really surprised by uh, is that there were so many people who came to these q&as uh, and they would say this is the first time that i'm watching a documentary in theaters so we managed to bring a lot of new audiences to theaters there is a lot of talk about uh the current wave of indian documentary the last two Oscars have had an Indian film nominated, Writing With Fire, two years ago, and All That Breathes uh, this year. From inside India, what is your perspective on this wave of Indian documentary filmmaking and its sustainability or challenges to that sustainability? I think it's absolutely incredible because, you know, f- for example, for, for sure, there's, there's a fair amount of challenges, but the achievements... I think, see, there have been a couple of films, right? There has been, of course, Writing with Fire, All That Breeds. There has been Cinema Travelers. There has been Machines. uh, And a couple of more films that are sort of, there's Against the Tide this year. You know, films start with a flight of imagination, with a fair amount, and during the process of production, a fair amount of courage, a fair amount of uh, uh, ambition and enterprise to see that these films have gone out into the world and achieved so much, I am in absolutely no doubt that this is a very rare moment that ap- that everybody should be celebrating. Of course, there's a fair amount of challenge in that, you know, for example, the, the funding and distribution for uh, documentaries in India is still nascent and we are still struggling. Uh, I agree. But that doesn't take away in any way from the achievements of all these filmmakers. And it's taken us decades to get here. I'll be very honest. It's taken p- filmmakers like Anand Patwardhan, Deepa Dhanraj, Nishtha Jain, uh, uh, who have made films for decades, setting up w- where the current lot of filmmakers are coming in, uh, uh, you know, where, from where all of us are working. But I think... For as long as filmmakers and audiences are ready and are able to build some sort of, for now, a direct connection between each other without necessarily relying on distribution ecospheres, if we are able to build a community around each other which is a little more direct, a little more intimate, the distribution ecosphere will eventually catch up. For now, it almost has to be much more guerrilla much more you know direct contact driven and much more personal like i am literally doing screenings every week of my film in india for gr- groups of 5 and 10 i am going to people's houses and screening them because i have zero shame in like making sure that the film gets seen like people will be like will you screen for four people and i'm like i bloody absolutely will i think for now uh, uh, challenging as it may be Distribution and and funding is both challenging in India right now. We don't have solutions, but the 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 people who are benefactors of uh, success, uh, such as myself and so many others, have to figure out a way of of passing on our privilege to others around us by building a community. It's absolutely urgent. It's, it's something that I take very seriously, and, and I know Shauna, Krintu, Susmit, all of us speak very often. And we are trying the, uh, our best to help each other out. So, so that's where we are at. I think we are at a very, very special moment. And uh, it's an incredible time for young filmmakers to feel empowered and feel that they can pick up the camera, make a documentary uh, that will actually get widely seen by people. I want to thank Vinay Shukla for speaking with me. His film, While We Watched, is now streaming in the U.S. from POV on PBS. (laughs) 
I hope you'll subscribe to Pure Nonfiction's email newsletters. We have Producer's Notebook on the business of documentary and Editor's Notebook on storytelling. You can subscribe for free at purenonfiction.net. Thanks to our team, series producer Anna Nordenswan, marketing manager Ella Rafflin, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. Follow us on Instagram at Pure Nonfiction. Fiction.